Good morning, welcome back to Computational Finance, Applied Mathematical Finance. Um, and today I like to start with interest rates. Yeah? So we will introduce interest rates and then define them as uh, yeah, random variables, stochastic processes, and later move them to interest rate models. Okay, so let's start uh, yeah, very simple. Okay, what is, what is an interest rate? If you borrow yeah, or lend uh, an amount N yeah, or invest an amount N today, yeah, so say today is uh, time little t. Okay, so maybe let's draw a little timeline here. So I have little t here. So then I maybe I invest some amount here. So then I expect to receive the amount back at some future time. So maybe that's part of the contract. So I expect to receive the amount back at some future time. And maybe I require to receive something in addition uh, that somehow compensates uh, for the time <clears throat> that I'm without this uh, amount. Yeah? So and this um, additional amount is uh, often considered to be uh, proportional to N. So I write this as N times one plus R. Yeah? So I receive that in time T, capital T. Um, well, actually the assumption that it is proportional to N seems reasonable uh, because if I invest twice the money, I would like to receive twice the compensation. You know? So it's usually considered to be proportional to N. Uh, however, this can be debated for maybe very large amounts. You know? There could be uh, a difference. Then uh, the second part is that uh, this uh, amount depends on um, the time span. Yeah? So we see there is an argument here, the time span. So if I invest for a longer time, I would like to receive a larger compensation. Uh, so it's maybe reasonable to um, calculate the quantity, how much money do I get per time? And this then leads to the term rate. Okay, so rate is that um, I express this amount in a per time basis. Uh, so I divide here by time. So uh, if you think of uh, physics, yeah, so you could ask yourself, okay, what is the unit of this quantity? Uh, so like meter or seconds or kilogram. Uh, uh, so, and the unit of this is one divided by time. Okay, so you, you would expect maybe that it is one euro per time. Yeah, so it is currency per time, but that is not the case because you see the currency is here in this N. Yeah, this is the amount I, I lent. Yeah, so the the unit of this object is one divided by time. And this is now our interest rate. So I have a definition of the interest rate, this compensating amount that I receive here. Uh, so in this chapter, I assume that all payments are guaranteed, though there is no, the, no issue related to default, yeah? so that, that uh, the borrower can default on the amount and I do not get back the amount. In that case, there would be additional part in the interest rate that compensates for the risk that uh, we can default. Um, that, that will come uh, later. Okay, so there is uh, something called uh, compounding because if you think that now my time axis, yeah, which I already had on the previous line, so there is here say a starting point of my investment is now discretized into smaller periods. Say so I start in T0, then T1, T2, T3. Okay, then I could start with some investment, say 
in zero and I could invest this over this period. And what I receive back here is maybe that green amount. So I invest here with an N zero in T zero. So, and I receive back some additional amount, which is one plus my interest rate. Now, because interest rate is per time multiplied with the time. So I receive back uh, this amount N one. Yeah? So, which is given by multiplying here with this expression, one plus interest rate multiplied with time. And then you can repeat this um, investment uh, strategy. So you can reinvest this amount. And what you see is that you also reinvest uh, the um, interest rate. Then I have here N2. And N2 is now N1 multiplied with the interest rate for the period from T1 to T2. Yeah. So note that here we have the period from T1 to T2. I have maybe a little bit strange notation here because I'm, I'm uh, writing the endpoint at the first argument. Then I write a semicolon and then I write the starting point. Okay, so you see here I, uh, maybe not so obvious, I introduced this strange notation that starting an endpoint yeah, uh, in the argument list uh, flipped, okay, that. If you are a computer programmer, you see you are free to define how the argument list looks like. And that has a reason if we will move on the next slide to stochastic interest rates, because um, there is one special property associated with the starting point. And that was already here on the uh, slide is this uh, last remark here. Um, the amount that we contract here is known at the beginning. Yeah? So we ask our bank, okay, what is the interest rate for the period from now to the end? And then they will tell us, okay, you will receive that amount of interest rate. So uh, if you think of stochasticity, uh, the object is F little t measurable. Uh, we know it in little t. Okay, so that's the reason why I uh, have some special role here for this argument, the starting point. Uh, so now I have the reinvestment for the second period. And for the second period, this is N1 multiplied with this. But you know, N1 is just this object here. So you can substitute it. Yeah, and you see that you have a product of N0 times 1 plus F from T0 to F1 times time period length, uh, multiplied with 1 plus interest rate from T1 to T2 multiplied with time period lengths. So in the end, you have something which grows exponentially. For example, if your interest rate is, say, um, a constant, uh, if the interest rate in all the periods is the same, then I would have here this constant, and I get something to the power of i for n i. And you can set now, uh, for example, R as the logarithm of one plus F times T divided by delta T. And then you can rewrite this as an exponential function. So you see that we have some exponential growth if the interest rate are always the same for each period. And if we perform successive reinvestment where we also reinvest the interest rate. So we get interest on interest. Um, okay, I will come back to this compounding um, in, in a few uh, minutes. So now we like to uh, discuss you know, more advanced interest rate model where interest rates become stochastic. Yeah? So we are uh, using stochastic processes to model the objects on the market, like in the Black Schultz model. Okay, so uh, let's think about stochastic interest rates. So the object um, F should be stochastic, should be a random variable. So in previous section, yeah, maybe you recall the Black Schultz model.
a model for our financial market, yeah, for example, here the Flex Schultz model looked like that. So we had actually only one object that was stochastic. It was here the stock. Okay, so we had one object that was stochastic, the stock. So I could nicely draw it here in a picture. It is a scalar value, yeah, and it can move randomly here around. And each of these guys here is one event omega on my probability space. Now with stochastic interest rates, yeah, actually you see from the previous slides, I have two parameters, two time parameters. There is the capital T, it is the, the um, well, maturity, yeah, uh, for that describes the time period or the time point up to which I'm borrowing or lending the money. And there's the little t, which describes the time at which I observe the object. So um, modeling interest rates already by this, uh, yeah, is demanding maybe for a much richer structure. So you see here, we already have a family of stochastic processes. So instead of, um, well, say um, a single object like a scalar stock price, here we just have a, a whole curve of objects parameterized by the parameter capital T. So these are random variables. Okay, so um, the interest rate which I observe for a fixed amount capital T At a fixed time, little t, this is a random variable. And now little t is my observation point. Uh, so it's uh, speaking of simulation, it is my simulation time. So if little t moves, this random variable can change. So a random variable that changes over time is a stochastic process. So the map little t to f of capital T little t is a stochastic process. So I can observe the interest rate uh, related to, um, yeah, maybe I'll draw, I'll draw a little picture here, related to a time here. Yeah? So I observe maybe that we have here this uh, interest rate from here to here. And then if time moves, so I move to another little t, then I observe the interest rate from here to here. And maybe that rate has changed, okay? So um, if I just like to consider the stochastic process, of course, I just drop the argument little t, and then I just write f of t. And you see, that's a little bit the reason why I um, put the little t as the last argument, because it's a little bit like in, uh, in computer, uh, yeah, programming, like going, yeah, so you have an option argument, which you can leave leave out. So uh, what do we have? So I have f of t is the stochastic process, f of t and little t is the random variable, and f of t, little t in the event omega is the interest rate observed at time t in state omega. Yeah? So that's, that's, that's the number. And you could also just put on top f, which is the stochastic process of the interest rate curve. 
Okay, so you see we have a much richer structure compared to um, yeah, a, a model which just models here a single stock. Yeah, now there is a small issue if we like to model this because you see it already here from the picture that uh, the interest rate is becoming shorter and shorter. So the time span is changing. Um, and another aspect yeah, which makes it a little bit more difficult to model this object is uh, here on the slide. Uh, so what happens if you look at different uh, maturities? So consider the case that I have uh, two times T1 and T2, then I would expect yeah, that two such interest rates, they are different. Okay, so again, a small picture here. So I have here maybe T1, here maybe T2. And now I consider for two different times, the interest rate say from here to here. So what does it cost to lend money or to borrow money from today to T1? And the interest rate maybe from here to here. And in this picture, I have to run it a little bit higher. You know? So maybe it costs a little bit more uh, to lend uh, or to borrow up to time T2. And this more is not related to the fact that the time span is longer because interest rate is already per time. You know? So if I expect that the per time interest rate is always the same, I would expect that this is the same number. It is already per time. Uh, so this difference, where where can it where could it come from? It can come from that maybe there is some seasonality, yeah, or there is uh, it is expected that the economy uh, changes, and um, so the interest rate for the time period from T to T one is not the same as for the remaining time period from T two uh, T one to T two. Huh? So this difference comes from that I have maybe an interest rate from here to here, and maybe an interest rate from here to here, and the two are not the same, such that if I borrow over the longer interval, uh, I see a different interest rate. So two such rates may be different. On the um, other hand, I uh, would expect that if, for example, T1 and T2 are close to each other, then the interest rates are not so different. Yeah? So they are also close to each other. So I would expect maybe that if T1 and T2 are close to each other, then also the interest rates are close to each other. Why? Yeah, because this um, interval here that gives me the additional uh, change is small and everything is on a per time basis. Yeah? So it is. it only enters in a very small uh, way. And you see there is some um, dependency between the, the uh, times capital T. And in order to model this more easily, uh, it's maybe nice to decompose the interest rate F into sub periods and instead of modeling the interest rate F for different times, it's maybe nicer to model the interest rates that only uh, de describe the additional interest earned over the additional time period. So um, it's easier to model these guys here all the small intervals, because then I can maybe assume that they are somewhat independent or what. Yeah? Uh, then to model these guys here. So from a modeling perspective, uh, maybe I would prefer to model the differentials and not the integrated uh, things. Uh, also, sometimes from a numerical point of view, it's better to model or implement differentials instead of model or implement integrated parts. Well, these re uh, red guys here, 
they look like a reinvestment strategy. And that is the reason why I had this compounding on the previous slide. So we already had this here, okay? So I have this reinvestment strategy. And you see, these are here the small objects that always describe the interest rate earned on the next interval. Hmm. Not um, precisely because you see that in this reinvestment strategy, there's a small issue, the time point at which I observe the object changes. Yeah. So these are, uh, if I now consider stochastic interest rate, these are random variables observed at different times. But I would like to express on the left-hand side, the interest rate observed at the same time, namely today. So, and that's the first question, how can I, uh, decompose my interest rate for different maturities into small objects that describe interest rates for future periods. Um, and uh, all these objects are known today. Yeah, how can I how can I decompose this? Uh, well, uh, first trivial way is I just define it. Okay, so you saw that in this uh, compounding, in this reinvestment strategy, uh, uh, the interest rate uh, that I, or the amount that I received at the end, so the amount that I received at the end was one plus the interest earned over the whole period. So this here is the whole period is given by the product of one plus the interest over a small period times period length you know, for, for each period. So I decompose this into such uh, factors and all the factors are small interest rates. Now for my little red intervals, my small intervals from T0 to T1, T1 to T2 and so on. And I do this for some time discretization. Yeah? So we have a given time discretization here, the periods from TI to TI plus one. Uh, and here at this point, I just define it. Okay, so you see there is here um, a double dot. Yeah, um, I just define the right-hand side. And I can successfully define this because I can go from, from K from one, which defines the first period, then I can use K equals to two and I can solve for the second period and so on. So I have now defined interest rates for these sub periods. So here I have the interest rate F for the first period, the interest rate F for the second period, uh, second maturity, third maturity, and so on. And from this, I can define an object that describes each individual period. And it's much nicer uh, to model actually L. So I already mentioned this. Um, the L and F, they look here a little bit like compounding. So like a reinvestment strategy. So this looks like L is defined by a reinvestment strategy. This would be the case if interest rates are not stochastic, uh, so don't depend on the little t. So interest rates do not change over, over, over time, little t here. Um, but um, the important thing is that this is uh, not the case. So note that all the interest rates L here are fixed in the same little t here. So I, I define here objects which are all in the same little t. So speaking of measurability, L is F little t measurable. Uh, so this is maybe not, not so satisfying because I just define this object and I have no intuition, is this a reasonable object? And in the following, I can give you a, a definition of L, which is much nicer and we will use objects on the market, namely 
very basic objects, zero ones. Okay, so that is a small uh, motivation introduction. Let's derive uh, this L here from objects which we can observe on the market. And then maybe this L is a nice quantity which we would like to model by a stochastic differential equation. And when we model this by a stochastic differential equation, what we get is we get all these small interest rates here um, for these periods. And these interest rates, they start at a certain value and then they can change over time yeah so they can move up or they can they, they can move down so you get a curve of interest rates and each individual guy uh, can move yeah so a very complex um, thing so we have a family of stochastic processes well a little bit you will see that um, I already introduced a discretization of my um, interest rate curve. Yeah? I started with a continuum and here I, I considered a discretized curve. Well, in the computer, often I do have to do discretizations anyway. Uh, so maybe that's not such a big issue. Uh, again, let me repeat that we have distinguished the times here. So now in this interest rate L, which I at this point just defined, I have three different times. There is the time period that is actually described by this interest rate. It is the interest rate I earn from here to there. Um, so the starting interval, start date of the period length period and the end date of the period. And there is the observation time at which time I observe this interval. So this guy here would be then say F little t measurable. If you think of a stochastic process, yeah, little t is the time at which I observe this object. Okay, so because on the right hand side, I have the interest rates for these times. Yeah? So, you're, so by solving this uh, equation, uh, which define the L, um, you see that actually L is the difference of F of T I and F of T I plus uh, minus one. Yeah? Uh, here it is uh, minus one to I. Okay, so maybe I should change the, the picture a little bit. So this is from minus one, to run. Okay. Um, so you see that it is the different of difference of f of ti and f of ti minus one. Well, the difference in this a little bit more complicated sense because L is actually a product, yeah? and it's the product of one plus L that defines the f. Okay. So this time discretization, capital T, that um, discretizes a little bit the interest rate curve or the continuum of maturities of payment dates. Yeah, um, This has a name, it is sometimes called a tenor structure. Okay, and the little t is the um, observation point that parameterized our family of stochastic processes. Yeah, the, the um, interesting thing is here that um, I can define an interest rate for a future period. Uh, so from say dates starting in the future and another year later in the future at an earlier time, say today. And you already see from this equation that I do this by asking for the two different interest rate, namely for the long period and for the short period. Yeah. And I can observe these objects here on the market. So, but on the market, maybe I do not observe interest rates. I mean, interest rate is an object something per time. It is a derived quantity. Uh, what I can observe on the market is maybe a bond uh, or a swap yeah, or some financial products. So what we have to explain is how do interest rate relate to these financial products? And what follows now is a discussion of this. Uh, all objects you see here are um, so 
random variable or stochastic processes. So that depends a little bit if I write the argument semicolon little t, or if I do not write the argument, then it is the stochastic process I'm looking at. Everything is modeled over some probability space and we have some reasonable assumptions here. To, to work with this. For example, in, in a later proof, I will use the uh, universal pricing theorem, though then I assume an equivalent Martingale measure exists and so on. So the, the basic object I would like to start is that of a zero coupon bond. Yeah, so here I just write bond, uh, but actually it is um, a zero coupon bond. So there will be also a coupon bond, but if I just use the word bond, I'm often referring to a zero coupon bond. So, and what's that? So that's now a financial product, maybe a financial product that can that I can observe, that I may observe on the market. Um, well, it's already a very idealized financial product. And it's the question, okay, I'm, uh, currently here in little t, and there is some future time t2, and assume I receive the amount one in t2. So actually one currency, so maybe you should have the currency here. Um, so what is the value of receiving one unit of this currency? Or put differently, how much money do you have to invest today in little t to receive that amount of money? Okay, and the corresponding value, or if I draw it in, um, in that I invest this, so I draw it with a negative sign, is the bond price pt2 observed in little t and actually here i draw i need to label this with a minus yeah because that is the amount i have to give away yeah or invest to receive this one unit um, of currency okay so here in the definition we have that a guaranteed payment of one unit of currency in time t2 So this is now considered as a traded asset and the value of this in times time little t is defined as the zero Cooper bond with maturity two. So the value of this product seen in time little t and now since we are speaking of random variables and in state omega is this price. So this defines then a random variable if I drop the omega and it defines a stochastic process if I drop the time and the omega. So I have here the stochastic process P of T2 and this stochastic process is defined for the time little t from say starting time say zero to t2 because then the financial product uh, is no longer existing yeah? i cannot buy something that guarantees me a payment in the past okay that's that's strange okay so the you see that this here is the time where i have my little t Okay, so I have this object. I assume that this object is traded on the market. And now I ask myself, can I derive the interest rates from this object? A very simple object. Nice thing about the simplicity is that there are not many conventions involved here. Yeah? So I just have the parameter T2 that tells me everything about this financial product. Well, um, the definition was looking at the financial product that pays one unit at time T2. And um, it expressed the value in time little t. Yeah? So the corresponding value is P of T2 observed in little t. 
in my example with the interest rates, I was actually looking at a different picture. I was asking if I have one euro today or one unit of currency today, what is then the fair amount that I would like to receive in T2? Okay, so what is the fair amount that I'd like to receive here? Well, I can immediately uh, construct this by saying, okay, I buy um, a certain number of zero copper bonds. So what I buy here is I buy a certain number of zero copper bonds. How many zero copper bonds do I buy? I buy one divided by P T2 observed in little t. Yeah, so I know the price of the bond. Actually, I, I need to write here one unit of currency. Yeah, because why? Okay, so small remark. The unit of this object here. Yeah, so the physical unit is now one unit of currency. Okay, usually I draw maybe the euro as currency, whatever. Yeah, so later we will have multiple currencies. Yeah, then models will come, become even more complicated, but uh, the unit is one currency. Uh, so I multiply this with this amount, yeah, and you see that uh, this uh, then cancels here this guy and replaces it with one unit of currency. And what I receive here in the end is just a little bit more than one, yeah, if interest rates are positive, it is say one divided by PT2. T. Yeah, and if you would like to have the units correct, you have to actually multiply this one euro squared. Yeah, that that that's looks looks a little bit fancy. Yeah, so maybe I'm I'm not that precise and drop it here. Okay. Um, so you see that this is the situation that is maybe a little bit more relevant to our question, what is the interest rate? Because now I can ask, okay, what is this additional amount here? So one divided by the value of the zero Cooper bond yeah, gives me uh, the uh, interest. Yeah, if I subtract one, yeah, so one divided by PT2 minus one, is the additional amount, then I should divide maybe by the time span to get the interest rate per time. So the value of this um, zero Cooper bond here is the amount that you have to invest at time uh, little t. But if you are, like to ask the opposite question, so if you invest one unit in time little p t, then you get back one divided by p t2. Yeah. So you simply buy the fractional number of zero copper bonds. So you already see what we are doing here is um, we build portfolios by buying fractional amounts. Yeah? So if you go back if you go back to our reminder of the universal pricing theorem of the universal valuation theorem, then remember that at the core was the value of a replication portfolio. And we are actually performing here a replication. Yeah? So how can I create the same amounts at certain times? What does it mean? A small remark I already did. Um, the zero copper bond we consider is uh, assumed to be default free. Yeah? So we the payment is guaranteed. We always get it back. So there is no concept of default. Uh, we will discuss this uh, later. The next interesting object is the uh, forward bond. And the forward bond is defined as the ratio of two bonds. 
So I define the forward bond PT1, T2 is the ratio of the zero bond PT2 divided by PT1. Okay, so what's that? First of all, what you see here on the slides are stochastic processes because I do not write the, the argument little t. Yeah? If I would add semicolon little t to it, it would be random variables. If I would add semicolon little t comma omega, it would be the numbers. Okay, so that makes it a little bit easier here to write this. It is everything is a stochastic process. It can change over time. So why am I defining this object? Why is this object of interest? Maybe draw a little picture. The zero couple bond P T one. So actually, it co co corresponds to. Well, it corresponds to, uh, maybe I draw this in blue. I need to pay the amount PT1 here, observed in little t. So this here is little t. And then I receive back I receive back one unit of currency at time T1. This is my bond PT1. Uh, the bond PT2, maybe I draw that in green here. This corresponds to in little t and now in T2, I have the cash flows I need to invest the amount or I need to buy the bond for the price PT2 observed at little t and I receive back one unit at time T2. Uh, now I just buy a fraction of the bond PT1. Okay, and what fraction do I buy? I multiply this with PT2 observed in little t divided by PT1 observed in little t. Well, actually here on the left-hand side where I write this a little bit symbolically, I cannot cancel this here because this here is the financial product I'm considering. And this here is just um, an amount that determines the, the fraction. Okay, so uh, just to express that what you have here is not PT2. Yeah, it's not PT2. I just say that I buy a fraction of the financial product PT1. So if you buy this fraction, so what will happen? Um, well, the cost to buy this is the cost of PT1 observed in little t multiplied with PT2 observed in little t divided by PT1 observed in little t. So there it cancels. So actually here, the amount that I have to pay is P T2 observed in little t, yeah? So when you perform this transaction, the amounts cancel and you see that you actually have to buy the same as below uh, for the PT2 bond. But what changes is I have a fraction of the financial product that pays back in T1 and what I receive back here is now one euro multiplied with this fraction. So multiplied with PT2 observed in little t, PT1 observed in little t. Okay, and now I do another small modification. I do not buy the fraction of PT1, I sell it. Yeah. So selling means I have a minus here. So, and the minus uh, in the picture, actually I didn't uh, draw the minus. So the minus here will just flip the guy. Here the arrow will move up. 
So I borrow that amount. So maybe to be precise here, there should be a minus and here uh, also. Okay, so I borrow that amount. I, I get it, yeah, it's plus. And then here actually I have a minus, yeah, a minus. So, um, so the red arrows are now borrowing um, an amount that is a certain fraction of the value here um, and borrowing it for the time from little t to t1. And now what I do is I construct the portfolio of the two. So constructing the portfolio means that I have the sum. So actually it is plus the PT2 bond minus a fraction of the PT1 bond, my portfolio. So, and what is the cash flow of this portfolio? So the cash flow of this portfolio is that I have here the queen run, which I have to pay, but I actually borrow exactly that amount. So I borrow the amount from the PT1 bond and I invest it into the PT2 bond. So you see that these guys here, they cancel. And what's left is, I forgot to draw here the red one that goes down. So what's left is the red one that goes down here, which is PT2 divided by PT1. And you receive back one euro. You see that I have a very nice construction now for this object here. The ratio of PT2 divided by PT1 is the price of a zero Cooper bond that actually starts in T1 and pays back in T2. So it goes from the period from T1 to T2 but the magic thing is that this thing is contracted. So it's observed in little t. I can observe in little t the price of a zero copper bond for a future period. That's precisely the object which we are interested in. Observe today, so fixed in little t. So with respect to stochastic processes, little f little t measurable, I observe uh, a time period in the future. Um, and again, if I would like to convert this to, if I invest here one unit, how much do I get back here? It's just the ratio flipped, it's pt1 divided by pt2. So it is uh, the inverse. Here in the script, again, you have the same picture or similar picture, yeah, so maybe a little bit, a bit nicer. And now the remark. So this forward bond um, corresponds to the value that has to be invested in time uh, T1 to receive back a guaranteed payment in T2. Yeah? So now it's moved to the future, but important it is, um, observed, so contracted in time little t. If we would like to look at the opposite thing, so if I would like to um, invest one unit in time uh, little t, then I can um, uh, take the inverse, so it is one divided by the zero Cooper bond. So obviously you have, if you set T1 to little t, then this is just a zero bond. So we will see there will be many different definitions of interest rates in the next uh, section. Um, 
which depend on a con convention. If you reinvest interest rate, uh, or so if you have interest on interest uh, or not, uh, but all the guys will actually derive here from the zero copper bonds. Okay, so now it's um, yeah reasonable to use this construction here to define the quantity L, uh, so our interest rate for a certain future period observed in time uh, little t. So this will be the forward rate. So if you ask yourself, given here my timeline, I'm here in little t, uh, I invest one unit of currency in t1. So I have here one unit of currency in T1. So how much money do I receive back in T2? So you would expect that you receive back the original amount invested in T2, but you also receive maybe something in addition. And then you see that this is just a fraction of a forward bond. Well, it is one divided by the forward bond price. So the amount that you receive back here is one divided by P T1 T2, the forward bond from T1 to T2. Well, observed in little t because I have contracted this in little t. So I just use this object one divided by the forward bond price now to define this red amount. The red amount is the thing that I um, receive in addition. So if I take one divided by PT1, PT2 minus one, this should be the additional amount received here. And then I also define it on a per time basis. So I divide by the time. Well, and um, my my L. Okay, so my my L, T one T two is now one divided by the forward bond price minus one, and then I divide by the time T two minus T one. Okay, and you see that because this guy here is just PT1 divided by PT2, you can write this one here as PT2 divided by PT2, and then you can define the interest rate L uh, in this way here. Okay, so that's a, a very prominent, very important object. It is the ratio, the ratio of the difference of the PT1 bond and the PT2 bond relative to the PT2 bond per, per time, okay? So if you speak of physical units, you see that uh, these guys here, they have units currency, currency divided by currency. So the physical unit of this object here is again, one divided by time. It's my interest rate interest rate fixed for the future period. Again, here I write everything without the little t parameter. So all the object are stochastic processes. If you plug in the little t for everyone, you have the equations for the random variables. Sometimes this guy is called LIBOR because it is, it is related to a convention of the, well, uh, London Interbank Operate, but uh, that's just for historic reasons. Yeah? So it is the uh, simple compounded forward rate. Now there are different ways of writing interest rates because you can just use this forward bond uh, and define your interest rates in different conventions. And you already saw that on my very first slide that was here, that if I have such an interest rate here in this notation, one plus rate, multiplied with time, then I can just make a substitution here uh, 
define some object as a logarithm. And I can also express this factor, one plus interest rate times time, as an exponential. So that's just another convention. So you see here, I have the double dot to the right hand side. So I can now define here the rate R as the rate that I need to plug in in E to the R times time period. Of course, you can solve this. And then you see that R is the minus the logarithm of the difference of the two bonds divided by time. So the ratio of the two bonds again comes from the forward bonds. So this is the so-called uh, continuously compounded forward rate because it resembles a reinvestment strategy that continuously pays interest on interest. So this will be the rate R from T1 to T2. Next definition, you can ask yourself, uh, what happens if I make the time period, you know, you, everything had, has happened on um, a time discretization. So we had here our little line and we had here a time discretization. So there is here a T, a capital T, and maybe there, there is here another T. What happens if I make this interval uh, smaller and smaller? Well, my interest rate does not go to zero because it is per time. Yeah? So uh, somehow I get the interest rate for an infinitesimal small period. Okay, so that object usually exists. So you can define the instantaneous forward rate, which is uh, the limit if you take L and make the end point approach the beginning point, make the period smaller. Yeah? So for an infinitesimal small period. There's also another object to describe interest rates. Well, all these objects here are maybe candidates for objects that should constitute a model. No? We, are, we are just defining objects that describe the market. And later we will ask ourselves, okay, which is a good object to create the model? Yeah, a short remark here. Um, this definition is maybe a bit um, strange with the limit, but if you plug in the definition of the forward rate L, well, then this was actually uh, the ratio of the bond at the beginning divided by the bond at the end, minus one and all the stuff. So this is actually the one, um, all the stuff divided by time. Yeah, if you look here, then you see this is one divided by PT2 multiplied with this difference here. And if you flip, flip this difference, yeah? So if I add a minus say here, um, so I can flip the two, then you see that this is just a differential. Uh, so an approximation of the derivative of the bond. So I have minus the derivative of the bond with respect to parameter capital T. So you see this here converges to PT. So you see that actually, if you take the limit, you get one divided by the bond at capital T multiplied with the slope of the bond curve in the parameter capital T. And you maybe remember that differentiating the function and dividing by the function again is the same as differentiating the logarithm. Yeah? So differential of a logarithm of a function by the chain rule is the differential of the function divided by the function. So you see, we are just differentiating the logarithm with respect to uh, time. So if you, if you think that the bond is say exponential minus R T minus T, if you take the logarithm, it will be minus R, if you uh, minus R times T. If you differentiate with respect to T, it's minus R. If you multiply with the minus, it's just R. Okay, so this is somehow extracting the R, you know, but um, with the fact that actually here the R is, well, not, um, in our case, it's not a constant. 
Yeah, but for the case where you have this simple interest rate model, yeah, the interest rate model that is associated with the Black Scholes model, for example, this is just the definition here is just extracting this R. And that's another uh, famous definition of the interest rate, the short rate. So what happens if you take uh, the capital T to approach the little t? So that's now here in my timeline, the interest rate, which I observe for the infinitesimal period. So I cannot draw an infinitesimal t period, but this here is t plus dt. Yeah, or maybe I should write T plus D capital T yeah, because it is the period. Um, so then here I'm looking at the interest rate that I observe today for the infinitesimal period that starts today. And yeah, from the previous definition, that's just differentiate the zero Cooper bond with respect to the parameter capital T and choose capital T little t. So the short rate is uh, the limit yeah, you, of, you can either say it is f of uh, little t, little t, or it is the limit of this rate r, which we had defined for capital T approaching to, limit, uh, to little t. It's also the limit of l. Yeah, So um, in the infinitesimal case, these guys are the same. In the discretized case, they are not the same. Okay, so that was um, an introduction of a bunch of interest rates. Um, we have the forward rate L, we have the instantaneous forward rate F, uh, which models infinitesimal periods, and we had the short rate R. And surprising fact, all these guys can be used um, to constitute a model. So if you start with the forward rate L, this uh, will give you the discrete forward rate model. So why discrete? Yeah, because um, we have a discretized interest rate curve. Yeah, we have a time discretization also sometimes called LIBOR market model or discrete term structure model. Um, if we model the instantaneous uh, forward rate F, yeah, then we have a continuum of infinitesimal periods. Yeah? So we have many, yeah, infinitely many infinitesimal periods. Well, that's maybe the mother of all these uh, models, uh, the HTM framework, very nice to derive some theoretical results. But the first one is maybe much nicer to implement in the computer because it already is a discretization. Um, and there are the short rate models, which just model the single rate at the beginning of the period. Um, these models also are able to dis fully describe the interest rate curve. Yeah, there is some, some, some uh, relation to the no arbitrage argument that this is sufficient. And these models have the nice effect that the short rate R is just a single scalar object. So it's much similar to what you came from, from Black Scholes, but they are so special that personally, I believe it is much nicer to start looking at these guys here and maybe look at short rate models later. Um, so we will look at models, modeling L, a discretized version of the HGM uh, framework. 